So welcome everyone and thank you all for joining us for the first round table of the Liverpool Fashion Summit 2021. Um, the second edition of Liverpool Fashion Summit um, under, within COVID coronavirus. Hopefully the third one, we can actually do it physically um, because we do have a, a, a wonderful social night planned that we've never actually been able to do yet, but hopefully we can do it uh, next year at 2022. So a small point of housekeeping, um, please do keep your microphones off unless you are speaking or perhaps at the end, uh, if, if you want to ask a question to either, to any of our speakers. Um, and if you can, because we love seeing faces, if you can turn your videos on, if you're comfortable, um, please do. Um, I've seen Emma, who was there from last year. Hi, Emma, good to see you again. <laughs> see, we recognize faces. Um, so today's discussion is very much at the intersection of fashion, modern slavery and ethical consumption. As we ask this key question, um, has the pandemic enlightened us to become ethical consumers? Today's round table will run for approximately 45 to 50 minutes um, and we will leave some space for a Q&A at the end. So obviously, please do, if you have any questions, uh, write them in the chat or perhaps even save them and turn your camera on and your microphone on at the end. Um, and you can actually speak live in person to, to our speakers. We do have five wonderful speakers for you today from across academia and industry, um, all with international um, experience. And we are very, very uh, lucky and blessed that they are joining us. So we have Hakan. Can you give us a wave, Hakan? Hakan is a sustainability management professional and academic researcher from the University College Dublin. His work has been featured in multiple academic journals and in Vogue Italia as well. We've also got uh, Sophie Benson. Sophie's a freelance journalist who's featured in The Guardian, Dazed and Refinery29. And she regularly writes on the topics of worker rights and greenwashing. We've got Vera, I'm gonna butcher your second name, Vera Hölscher. <laughs> You can correct me in a minute. Um, who's a lecturer in marketing at Royal Holloway uh, with a focus on shared spaces of ethical consumption. We've got Barty Patel, who's a child rights and social justice advocate and an ambassador for an organization called Justice in Fashion. Barty has over 20 years experience in the executive C-suite of many leading influential charities. And then last but very much not least, we have Sharon Benning Prince, who is a lawyer by trade, but also the anti-slavery envoy for the Medail Trust. She also provides assistance to IJM, which is International Justice Mission. And Sharon is also the founder of Justice in Fashion. So thank all five of you. Thank you all very much for, uh, for being here and giving your time with us. Um, I just wanna start with, uh, quite a broad question, given that we are talking about um, ethical consumption and ethical consumers. Um, and I think if I may, I'd like to put this to Sophie first. Um, given, given your interaction in the public uh, space and, and journalism, what do we actually mean by the ethical consumer? Hmm, that's a good question. I think, I think it means a lot of, you know, different things to different people, but broadly, um, you know, we're talking about someone who researches before they buy, you know, cares about how things are made, where things are made, what they're made of, um, and the, the kind of overall human and environmental impact that they have. In a nutshell, I would say that's what we're, what we're thinking about when we're talking about a, uh, an ethical consumer. Yeah, so it's, it's having awareness of the self and the rest of the world around it. Uh, Vera, with your research into ethical spaces, is there anything that you could add to that? Yeah, so I think the problem is that even with the very bestest of intentions, it is a system that is rigged against consumers in terms of the systems that are in place. Uh, there is a lot of branding also that happens within the arena. So of course I'm a marketing scholar, so I know a thing or two about how uh, there is, just like Sophie writes about, there's so much greenwashing as well. Uh, so people kind of think that 
certain consumption choices are, as a matter of fact, ethical when they're perhaps not. And also the question is, to what degree can somebody actually fulfill this notion of being an ethical consumer across all of these different spheres, say, from fair trade chocolate, fair trade sugar, fair trade uh, fashion, building materials, the list goes on and on. And there's so much even hidden within fair trade, for instance, are women fairly compensated within fair trade work, etc. So there are numerous issues. And I think for a consumer alone, it is absolutely a brutal um, minefield to try and navigate in order to truly be an ethical consumer. Yeah, thank you, Vera. Um, Hakan, I, I saw you nodding just uh, when when Vera began talking. Do you want to come in on, on sort of the interaction with branding? Sure. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here and hi everyone. Um, so I look at supply chains and I look at upstream operations and I see the, the, the clash between long-term sustainability objectives and short-term financial gains. And actually this is the, the elephant in the room, overconsumption and overproduction. So even before delving into what defines ethical, ethical consumer, I really want to highlight the importance of evidence and proof. So today in this creative fashion space, we see lots of buzzwords, hashtag circularity, hashtag justice, hashtag transparency. But what do we really mean by these keywords? So the main question is, how can we move from window dressing to evidence-based performance disclosure? How can we make sure we are seeing authentic and transparent disclosure coming from the brands? Here, consumers are so powerful because we have our voice. And now actually we can use our voice constructively to ask questions and to demand transparency. But number one question to me is to also question our individual habits. When we look at the literature, there's a clash between attitudes and behaviors. So as consumers, to what extent am I empowered to use my voice to lend my agency to the workers to bring those real life issues to the spotlight. And more importantly, what is my relationship to the clothing and to fashion? So again, as a system, we need each other. And I think this goes beyond one actor. We just need to create a social dialogue in which consumers are super important. It was a long answer, but I just wanted to break the ice. So sorry. That's <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, I can. And I think it, it's, I don't, I don't know whether you meant to do it, but it's a nice segue, you, the use of the word voices, because I know the team at Justice and Fashion um, have been building a, a platform for, for workers' voices. Am I right? still right in that, Sharon? Yes, it's very much the case. Um, I just have to add something. There's another nice segue, Hakan, you just used there. This morning I was listening to the radio and, um, of course, the... Uh, the, the guilty charge of the, the policeman in the George Floyd case this morning, um, the voice of, you know, the football Super League, which I won't pretend to understand at all because I don't, um, but those clubs backing down. So there was a real thing on the radio this morning about how people use their voice to make transformation and make change. And thus we've had both these two quite fundamental things, well, one I, in my mind being slightly more fundamental than the other as not being a football fan. But I think you're right in that the consumer has a real force and a voice in trying to make transformational change. Um, and going back to our sort of workers, um, for which we have a platform at Justice and Fashion, um, to hear sort of you know the issues that are arising at the other end of the supply chain with those workers, just giving the consumer some understanding. Um, and I think pause for thought to consider not only their own choices when, they're, when we're consuming ourselves, but also the impact of our choices. Um, if you look at some of those, those worker voices and their stories, I think sometimes we forget how close we are in the supply chain to those workers. That actually, you know, in our minds, we go to the shop. And again, last week, I was looking at those mass queues outside Primark and really gritting my teeth which I shouldn't because it's very judgmental but I thought my goodness you know as people are going on mass they've been queuing since whatever it was six o'clock in the morning in their minds are going out 
they're buying, they haven't been able to have the ability to buy physically from a shop for a long time. Do they understand those choices that they're making when they go into those shops? And I'm, I'm not singling Primark out particularly, but it's just the example I'm using from last week. But do we really understand the impact we're having when we go and we're purchasing, go to the till? What is that cascading impact down the supply chain? And, you know, we think it's so far removed. It, it's actually so much closer, so much closer um, than we'd like to think. Um, so, yes, Ollie, yes, we are still showcasing all those worker voices. Um, and I think they're the ones really that we should be listening to in order to make this transformational change. Um, you know, ultimately, it starts and ends with them, I think. Um, but as an ethical consumer, we need to re-deliberate on what are we buying, why are we buying, and, and who are we really impacting, and what are we impacting globally in making those choices. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Barty, I just, just want to bring you in and, and give you a voice in, in, in this conversation. And I think we've started to move into a discussion of what the current barriers are to ethical consumption. But I know with your experience, you've, um, you've probably got quite a holistic view. Well, thank you so much. This is going to be a really, really exciting um, discussion because I think all of us are coming from very different perspectives. But yeah, I, I agree with what Hakan's saying, definitely what Sharon's saying. I think ethical consumerism is an aspiration. It's not something that, that we can do and solve the issue of what's happening in the fashion industry. So it's something that we as hopefully ethical consumer aspire to. We'll never know everything about what's happening in the, in the kind of supply chains um, that produce our, that make our final product that we will buy it. So when Sharon talks about it's close to you, it's remote, I think it's very much that. I think the distance between the worker at the bottom of the supply chain, as a consumer, I don't know. The only way I know about it is through reading in the press. So, so the, the most thing that, I think the best thing that the, that, um, that's happened in this sector and highlighting the exploitation is what the, the journalists have done, what the media has done. So that's got us closer as consumer to, uh, to what's happening. But are we in a position to change anything? And I think this is the, the, one of the barriers that, A, it's a very complex um, issue. There are so many actors and so many um, factors that are involved in, in abuse and exploitation. So I think it is complex. I do believe that also, there's too much weight being put on the consumer to address this very complex issue. So if you look at, and if I can just bring that very quickly, if you look at some of the legislation, particularly our government, when they introduced the Modern Slavery Act, they asked the, the, the brands to say, uh, what is it that you're going to do about um, any kind of findings on um, modern slavery like condition in your supply chains but that's okay if you don't do anything don't worry about it just you know make a statement that you haven't done anything and then I remember at the time Theresa May who was then the uh, the lead on the modern slavery act who said we will then leave it to the consumer to decide whether they buy that product or not so again it's very much asking the consumer to hold brands accountable for this rather than um, taking government taking responsibility. So I think one of the key barriers is the fact that the government has passed its buck onto the cust customers, onto the consumer. And there's no way we can, even as much aspiration we have, no way we can address this just by limiting our, uh, or using our power to hold the brands accountable. Thank you, Barty. I just want to come back to Sophie because uh, I think Barty was quite, quite complimentary about um, about um, journalists and the role that you play and then perhaps after that can we go to Sharon just for a, a, a legal uh, perspective on on the UK modern slavery act yes so in, in terms of kind of consumers um, you know taking taking a lot of responsibility you know I in all of my work I make sure that um, I'm uh, kind of mindful of what the barriers are and I often kind of reach out to consumers and people who um, 
you know, wouldn't necessarily class them as themselves as ethical consumers. You know, I speak to people who wear things once and then throw them in a bin bag and throw them away. Or equally, I've spoken to people who, you know, do loads and loads of research, but they feel like they're tripped up because, you know, their budget or their time or, you know, their um, sensory issues, for example, um, you know, they have to shop with certain brands. Um, and, you know, the recent research has shown that, you know, almost half of consumers feel that brands are making it harder for them to be ethical from day to day. Um, because, you know, they're, as the conversation opens up um, and more and more of this kind of really um, alarming information comes out about what's happening in supply chains or what's happening in warehouses or to, to garment workers, um, it, people feel like their options are shrinking. And so it's really difficult to, you know, to make these decisions. And even people who work within this industry, it's, it's hard to keep up with everything. You know, sustainability and, and ethical fashion, it's such a broad church. Um, and, you know, we, we don't know all the, you know, every, doesn't, not everyone knows every single piece of legislation that's coming down the line or every new development. So how can we expect sort of the everyday consumer to be able to do that? I think people are kind of making their best choices um but it's it's incredibly confusing and so you know without a you know being a complete expert on this kind of thing people are going to either knowingly or unknowingly take wrong turns as consumers and we have to accept that and expect change elsewhere so that consumers can rely on brands to make the right decisions for them so that they're not the ones having to um you know be responsible for what's happening and what choices they make Thank you, Sophie. Uh, Sharon, just before we move on, um, can you comment on Barty's um, uh, commentary on the on the UK Modern Slavery Act? Yes. Yeah, so, just I suppose to give a very quick summary for those who don't who aren't that really au fait with the, the Modern Slavery Act, um, it, it came into enforcement and legislation in 2015 in the UK. Um, Theresa May, as Barty stated when she was Home Secretary, pushed um, quite efficiently and officiously uh, for this piece of legislation. Um, it has its, and, I, and I'm biased in this regard, um, it, it has its uh, downfall in that whilst it was meant to be a very rigorous piece of legislation, um, it was meant to impose upon uh, companies of a certain size, financial turnover, uh, an obligation to produce a statement and to produce um, their disclosure in what they were doing in their supply chain. So we call it the TISH provisions, but it's, it's the transparency provisions. They're meant to show what um, processes they're following in order to ensure that forced labour, modern slavery, isn't um, apparent within their supply chain. The problem is, the downfall of it is there is no penalty or legal penalty per se um, if there's no adherence to the legislation. So yesterday I was listening to an interview uh, with an MP about the boohoo scenario in Leicester um, and he said quite candidly <laughs> and, and sort of very, very poker face way he said you know what businesses really believe in modern slavery act and the legislation they believe it complies with everything they should do. And I sort of laughed when I was listening to that because in effect, at the moment, it's really just a tick box exercise uh, for companies. Um, for all intents and purposes, you can actually say, we don't really do anything and you still to a degree be fine. Um, that is changing. Um, there is more, I suppose, force and pressure for those provisions to be amended um, so that actually brands become more uh, rigorous in their disclosure and actually that we at one point in time see that there might be uh, a financial uh, penalty in non-enforcement. Um, but he's right though, it, it, at the moment that legislation is not strong enough uh, to underpin what should be um, instrumental in, in helping and ensuring that there is transparency in the supply chain. Um, and it certainly doesn't go far enough, in my personal opinion, 
um, to help or to actually address the systemic issues that we know are actually within the supply chain. And again, it doesn't really help consumer make the choices that perhaps they want to um, if they're trying to buy ethically. Thank you for that, Sharon. Um, I think it's given us a, um, a good insight into the legislation that underpins a, a lot of the work that, that many of us do. I just want to take us back to this idea of the ethical consumer or ethical consumption, almost as the as the individual as well. And, and rather than go to anyone in particular, I'm just going to put this to the group. So um, what is it? Fastest finger first. Um, just wondering if any of us have a view on how consumption has changed since specifically since the beginning of, of the pandemic with all these lockdowns and COVID and things like that. Well, I think there's a lot more consumption in the home sphere. Uh, and of course, that means that some of the consumption habits that perhaps some people wanted to kick before are actually coming back with a vengeance. Say, for instance, Amazon, um, Uber Eats, Deliveroo, etc. cetera, uh, because it is just so difficult to kind of consume ethically to purchase only from small local businesses, et cetera, when um, you, for instance, like I'm not exempting myself and I feel horrible about it, but I was a new parent during the first lockdown. And sometimes you desperately need that one thing of baby equipment that you hope is gonna make your life better, you know, and who's gonna deliver that? Who's gonna deliver that in 24 hours? Uh, so I think there's sometimes there's also, um, like uh, we said before, there's so much pressure on consumers, there is not necessarily a system in place to allow them to shop ethically, to, to shop in a just way. And yes, like, why are certain things even legal? Like, why is it onto the consumer to decide to either purchase something that shouldn't be legal, uh, if workers' rights actually were worth something, versus um, you know going for the other option which is going to be considerably less convenient um, considerably slower perhaps even more expensive etc when you also have to take into account the consumer's own vulnerabilities so for instance i was involved only as a, a research assistant but that meant that i was the one who actually carried out the interviews in a project on modern day slavery. And one of the consumers who I interviewed, she actually broke out into tears in front of me. And she said she feels so guilty about shopping at Primark, etc. But her salary doesn't really allow something different from that. So we also have to account for the consumer's own vulnerabilities in this. Um, if I could just jump in, Hakan, I know you want to come in. Um, I, th I think, Vera, you, you're absolutely right, but, but also some of us do feel that we need to be consuming ethically. Um, the question is, will this last? Um, and also, uh, is there a real long-term behavioral change? I'm not sure there is. I think temporarily we'll all think about it, but as Vera said, um, if that's all that we can afford, that's what we'll buy. And, and then there's this whole pressure of you having to, you need this as opposed to be you, rather you want it as opposed to be you needing it. So I think that's, that's one of the issues. Will it change? Click and Collect has, has in fact made it so much easier for us to consume. So it's all now online. All I need to do is, is look at what's available and click and collect it. So it's made it so easy for, for me to consume more and more. So I, I'm not sure that we are going to see a huge behavioral change um, in terms of um, ethical consumerism. I do feel unless the other factors change, one of them is certainly uh, making sure that people have got a much, much higher disposable income so that they can buy that slightly higher price product or that the highest higher price products actually are truly ethical in every sense. So how do I know? It goes back to what Sophie was saying. How do I really know that this is? So I, I just, again, I go back in saying that we are putting far too much um, 
onus on the consumer to decide whether we change our behavior or not. Very little on the behavior of the brands and the behavior of the government to change that would allow us to be ethical in our consumerism. Hakan, I'm so sorry. No, please. Thank you so much. Amazing insights. I just want to ask a simpler question. Do we need a label to define who we are, whether we are ethical or not? Just let's remember one thing, lack of empathy. The most important thing, exactly, why are we consuming? Because the business model is just profit driven and it is insensible. It is pushing us to perceive that we need things that we don't. Here, the main problem is this broken system legitimizing the business model is making us to think that we actually need those items or how can we actually consume more and more. So the main issue here actually the common sense knowledge and the empathy, we just need to think why are we consuming and to what extent we are really trying to challenge the status quo. These are very systemic issues and there are inherent contradictions, but I will give one example. Skin is the largest organ that we are putting that we have in our bodies. So skin is this the largest organ. Whatever we are putting on our bodies is actually absorbing all of those chemicals. And then we are also seeing health implications. We have skyrocketing numbers in terms of cancer because we are using chemicals that are not actually legal, that actually we are seeing in the fashion supply chains. We are having social crisis across fashion supply chains that are far away from where we live. But as uh, Sharon was saying, these problems are real and they are not that far away. So again, this um, traditional business as usual setting will not allow us to transform the system from within unless we create a very radical social dialogue. Incremental actions will not work. Top-down strategies are not going to function or incremental legislations will help us become only legitimate. What do we need is to really, at this moment, is to, to create a transformative social dialogue with radical policies, conscious consumption patterns, and transparent and responsible practices. So fashion supply chain problems are our problems. We are human beings and we belong to this sphere. We just need to make this entire dialogue inclusive and representative. So again, this is not consumer's responsibility, but at the same time, time is up. We also need to stand up to actually claim our agency and our power. We need to create this all together. So we are equally responsible. Can I just jump in there? I just want to follow on from what, you know, a couple of people have said, mentioned um, Primark and disposable income and, and talking about this, um, kind of insatiable, uh, you know, um, volume of production. Um, and I think it's always worth remembering that, um, you know, this modern kind of crop of fashion brands we've had, that we have, have really cynically, um, you know, made consumers adjust their perception of value. So, you know, when I interview consumers and talk about what they can afford and people will say, well, I can only afford, you know, Boohoo or whatever brand it is. And then you'll ask, well, how much do you spend on fashion a month? And they might say, you know, I spend 100 or 150 pounds. And then they'll talk about how, you know, a 70 pound garment isn't affordable to them. You know, in reality it is, but what they've been, you know, brought up with, what they've been told, what's been reinforced by these brands is that, um, cheap fashion is a form of democracy and it's allowing people access to it and we deserve five pieces a week or it's our right to buy you know 10 pieces of fashion a month um and if you're if you're constantly hearing that messaging then that's of course how you'll feel um but realistically you know a lot of people who are, you know, buying multiple cheaper garments can afford to invest more, but there's been this complete um, kind of brand focused uh, value switch that I think, you know, uh, people often overlook, but I think it's really, really worth looking into. There are obviously consumers who simply don't have any other options. They can't, you know, there is no, you know, they have to buy the cheapest, what's out there, 
you know, there isn't another option. Um, but also I do think we, um, and I, a lot of kind of middle-class journalists are really um, guilty of doing this, kind of creating this sort of poor consumer who's perpetuating fast and unethical fashion, when realistically it's people who have more disposable income who are keeping these systems going and who are upholding this, um, you know, this market and this process of overconsumption. Do you mind if I just quickly jump in, Sophie? Those are really good points, actually. And um, I think it's very chicken and egg. And, and Hacken, again, raised a really good point there. And I, I don't know how old you are, Sophie, and bless me, I'm not assuming anything here. But I remember back in the day when I was a teenager, one still would go down to the high street. And this was before the Primarchs of the day and whatever were even on the high street. But even within monks, amongst your groups of friends, it was always like, oh, what are you going to wear on a Saturday night? There was, there was a sense of, and even though I had myself been brought up um, in, in quite a financially <laughs> um, wise and, and sort of um, frugal way, you know, there was one thing a season and, you know, your parents didn't buy you any more than that. And if you did, you had to work for it. There is a sense of, you know, oh, it'd be nice to have a new outfit for a Saturday night. And, and I'm, I, yes, I think it has been propagated by the brands and marketing. Um, I'm also a cynic. I think when you are also on a daily basis exposed to celebrities who are, you know, oh, my goodness, look at they're, they're putting together a trousers, you know, a pair of trousers from Primark, matching it alongside a nice Chanel vintage jacket. Again, that's that propagation of, actually everyone else can do it too if they can do it as well so I, again I'm not you know I'm not defending the brands here by any means um, but I don't think it's just brands I don't think it's just cynical marketing I think there's a whole societal uh, desire that's also inherent in, in most of us um, you know and I'm just looking at some of the questions here um, why is it normalized of you know for us to have so much clothing and, and someone actually just raised a really good question on the chat about you know are we now going to have to prop up the economy by going out um, and purchasing and actually if we if we just listen to Rishi Sunak he is encouraging us I mean <laughs> the what was it the um the eat out uh, whole scheme in August last year. And then suddenly everyone jumped on it and said, oh my God, and he, was in, he was encouraging obesity um, by actually you know, telling us to all go out and eat out and, and, and help the restaurants. I mean, is there a similar psychological thing here now, Rishi's saying to us, go out and prop up the economy and, and let's you know, sort of in, encourage it again by going out and purchasing. There's so many mixed messages. Um, and something I know Barty probably um, would love to raise, but I will raise it as well. Um, you know, she had the opportunity to talk on a, on a um, moderator panel the other week with a phenomenal, phenomenal individual who runs um, a factory in Bangladesh, Mustafa Udin. Um, for those who are, of us who are in this industry, you know him very well, and he's very vocal um, on worker rights um, and the way he sort of um, runs his own factories. He interestingly raised a point um, about actually uh, production in his factories and that if we do not buy the clothing that they are producing in those factories, his workers will have no jobs and they will have no financial stability. It's a really interesting discussion because that's someone who we assume um, in Bangladesh is there with the workers working and talking on behalf of the workers. We assume that he should perhaps have a different position on that, but actually he wrote an open letter to Angela Merkel to say, open up your high street, because without you opening up your high street and encouraging people to purchase and buy, our workers will not survive. So again, there's so many factors to this. Just in fashion, we talk about the voices of the workers, we talk about the bottom of the supply chain, but actually here's someone who's representing those workers and actually saying to us, go out and buy and encouraging us to go and purchase. So again, the consumer has these really, I think, very confused messages, not only from, you know, I've cited Paul Rishi Sunak, but you know, the government saying, go out, let's go and encourage and stimulate the economy, go out, buy, buy, buy. 
Um, we also have these mixed messages from the brands themselves saying, hey, look, you know, I mean, I was looking at Boohoo's advertising, these gorgeous long limb things, you know, in the sun, very small clothing. Um, you know, it, it's it's buying a dream. It's it's thinking, you know, we've all come into lockdown and we're all going to go en masse out to the pubs and whatever else. Let's get a new outfit because, you know, we, we haven't seen our mates for so long. There's just so many confusing messages. I think for the ethical consumer, and someone again raised a question in the chat, what is ethical? I think we're just exposed to too many things and too many ideologies. I think it's hard for us just to see the wood for the trees in it all. Sorry, Ali, that's the end of me. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Um, I didn't know whether uh, Barty wanted to come in. It's unmute. Um, no, Sharon, you are absolutely correct. And I think this is where one has to look at, I'm going to use this word, sorry about this, but the whole issue about capitalism. I mean, you know, we are, we are in that. We are all, brands are all about maximizing their profit at any cost. Suppliers are very much also about maximizing their income at often at any cost. Governments are selling their people, their land, their natural resources to invite brands to come and invest in those countries. So I think Made in Ethiopia, brilliant research done by, I'm trying to think of his name, but basically the report's called Made in Ethiopia. And this is where the government actively, um, proactively invites brands to invest in their country, offering the cheapest labor in any other apparel making uh, country. So, so there is this competition um, on, on lowering wages, on, on inviting brands to invest in countries so that they can get it very, very cheaply. So I think employment is one of the drivers here that, that brands will sell their investment to the governments in these countries to say, we're going to create employment for your workers. So this is all fine. But it's really very much about brands maximizing their profit. And so I think we really, really have to question, and that's a huge, a big issue. I mean, nobody, no individual consumer um, or even collect, collected, collective of consumers gonna change this. But it, yeah, these are questions that we really, really have to ask. How much profit is being made? I think three, four years ago, the ILO, International Labor Organization, did a brilliant research that talks about 150 billion pound profit is made annually from slavery-like conditions of workers, of which over 50%, over 50% is made in the developed, so-called developed economies, the EU economies. So you can see the kind of very siphoning of funds, of resources from the poor countries for the so-called developed countries. So, so we need to question as well, you know, brands have talked about losing billions as a result of the lockdown. But how much profits have they been making over the years and at whose cost? Nobody's asking these questions. I think every brand should be actually, rather than um, putting figures on their, um, on their annual reports, we really need to ask, what is the scale of your profit? And is there a willingness for brands to take a cut in their profits and use that to invest in the workers in the countries that they are, um, so, you know, they are procuring from. So, big questions to ask, and I think we should. I stop there. Absolutely, we should, and I will just jump in because it is a very important question which we all need to ask. We should be critical, and we should be asking financial breakdown and financial transparency. Democratizing the democratization of fashion cannot happen because of setting doesn't have democracy, doesn't have justice. So whatever we will be doing for top brands will just help them become more and more profitable and much, much, much richer. But here the main problem is again, calculated, misinform calculated misinformation. There's so much information out there about the numbers or the facts, etc. 
So the brands and many lobbying groups are creating these misperceptions or misinformation just to make us believe that certain things are right or not even questionable. Here, I wanna talk about the paradigm shift. We cannot help fashion resp become responsible or become sustainable unless we challenge the business model, which is linked with capitalism. We need to push degrowth. Degrowth doesn't mean that we will jeopardize workers' rights. On the contrary, we will bring environmental and social justice into the financial diagram. So success or growth can no longer be measured by financial terms. We need environmental and social indicators to understand what is growth and what is success for the upcoming chapter of fashion. Business as usual as it is, is broken and we cannot change a system in that space. We really need to tear down the culture and we need to rebuild something based on justice. And again, brands need to redistribute wealth and power. The main problem and main issue here, power imbalance, lack of transparency. We just need to make sure this social dialogue is created with the workers, with everyone that is actually affected negatively because of this business model. We are creating fashion at the expense of people. We are purchasing things that make brands richer at the expense of people. Therefore, my invitation to all of us, let's be critical. Let's exactly ask serious questions to everyone, but let's make sure we understand one thing. The elephant in the room is actually overproduction. And we are always gonna see this tension between overconsumption and power distribution. But we are not actually proposing to take away jobs from these people. We are not proposing to stop consuming things. We are just asking people to be responsible with their choices. And we are asking brands and legislations to ask for transparent financial breakdowns to make sure power is redistributed across the chain, not for the top. Yeah, I think you raised some key points, Hakan. Um, I'm just wary of time, because I said we'd have a bit of a Q&A. And I know, I know Sean's touched on some of the questions, but I'd like to revisit them um, uh, as a group. Just before I do, um, so Vera, any last comments on sort of the conversation so far before we go to a Q&A? I'm sorry, I think we both jumped in at the same time. Uh, oh, yeah. I to say that, that there's been some brilliant questions also in the chat. And I really like, for instance, the one about the degrowth model coupled with the circular economy. And that's something that I raised also in one of my um, sessions with Oli, uh, where I said, well, it, it doesn't have to be about necessarily doing away with GDP. It doesn't necessarily have to do away with um, production as such, but it has to do away with extraction, I suppose, of more and more raw goods. And I'm, I'm not trying to be, na be naive here. I realize that uh, certain things we will always have to drill out of the ground or it, it has to be very slow degrowth. It's, it's a complicated system, as Bharti also said earlier, but it's not impossible. Like we have enough innovation. We have enough bright minds. It's not impossible. And then I think, yeah, just um, finally, um, I just wanted to, make, and it kind of ties back to one of the questions as well about um, um, what I think it was Sharon who um, who said about, you know, the the idea of us, us buying things to support the economic recovery. Um, and I just think, you know, I would note to consumers just to be very wary about kind of the conflation of consumerism and citizenship. I think, you know, we, we've seen that in America in the 1920s and we've seen that kind of happening uh, through our history. And yes, there is a, um, a need to, you know, to, to boost the economy and to, you know, to a certain point, but equally it doesn't have to happen at this scale. It's completely bloated at the moment. And so I think, you know, it's just a note to just be quite wary of that messaging, you know, shop, shop for your country is quite a damaging message to, uh, to put out there. Yeah, thank you for that, Sophie, and, and thank you, Vera, as well. 
Um, okay, I think in the last 12 minutes, we'll just revisit some of the questions. So uh, first ones were from Kate. Hi, Kate, see you at your video on. Um, do you want to come off mic, off mic, by the way? And do you want to ask the maybe your second question yourself? Good Sorry, to see you. I wasn't prepared. expecting to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so my uh, mic was tied up in my hair. Um, so I work as a circular economy consultant, and I just wanted to say this has been really fascinating um, to hear everyone's different points of view and um, lots of interesting conversations. So thank you very much. Um, I think the first question that I was sort of flagging up, which has been answered, was just about that economic recovery piece and how we actually decouple the concept of um, recovery from consumption because I think Sophie your point there about trying to avoid that conflation between citizenship and consumption it's easy to say that in practice but I think it's very very difficult for consumers not to feel pulled into this idea of sort of bouncing back with consumption um, and also how do we actually make a degrowth model work in reality when there's such a powerful lobby for the opposite? So it's just, I mean, it's a big question, but if there's any sort of ideas or um, places that you would recommend looking for some of these bigger ideas about how we actually challenge a system that's basically trying to do the opposite of everything that we've mentioned today. I can just jump here. Thank you, Kate. It's a great question. And actually, it is a very systemic issue to give the growth model and circular fashion. But these are very transformative strategies for which we need a proper social dialogue. Therefore, we need to really craft a long term strategy. Therefore, incremental actions or easy solutions will never work. We really need to create solutions with the people that will be affected. Let's go to the coal power industry. Let's go to steel industry. Many industries that actually transitioned to green energy, but they created solutions with the people, with a bottom-up approach. In the fashion industry, what doesn't function because people don't seem to understand, this is a very dynamic conversation and it is not gonna happen with top-down approaches. So we really need to bring all of those voices into the solution when we are creating them. So the growth model is quite doable. Donut model is quite doable, but we just need to understand the business as it is, is not gonna facilitate this. Therefore, we really need to craft a social dialogue to create something transformative. It is a long discussion to have, but um, we just need to make sure this is quite inclusive and actually socially um, hybrid. Uh, hybrid. This is my um, takeaway. Actually, it's my research. If you want, we can discuss this later. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Hakan. And thank you for your questions as well, Kate. I know you've been you've been quite engaged. Um, I just want to move on to uh, I'm sorry, is it Tony Tobiason? I think it might be. Uh, if it's not, please correct me. But I think Tony's asking, uh, why is it legal to import into the EU or Europe products that are illegal to produce here? I read that correctly, based on labor laws, environmental laws. So she's talking about um, the disparities between uh, legal systems in and out of the UK. And I think after Brexit now as well, um, uh, the potential disparities between the UK itself and, and, and the rest of the EU. So I think why, um, oh, I suppose maybe the question is, is it possible to have uh, that level of oversight between cultures across boundaries where we can begin to rebalance or readdress a system um, that has different types of uh, labour um, and uh, labour environments. I'll just jump in here very quickly because, of course, from a legal perspective, we will have the EU mandatory um, due diligence environmental legislation 
which is meant to encompass across Europe uh, the full transparency due, due diligence for um, companies that are actually registered within the within the within Europe, and will look to actually imposing, I suppose, that higher standard that that we're all seeking. It's an interesting one to see whether the UK will fit into that, but of course, with Brexit, you know, we stand slightly alone now. Um, but that being said, my understanding of where the EU mandatory legislation or framework will go is that it will still ensure and enforce to a certain degree uh, and dictate what we do here in the UK. Um, certainly I'm seeing the parallel and it is a parallel with the data protection legislation currently, um, where seemingly the, the UK is not going to be of the same standard as, as the, the data protection security standards within the EU. So in order for us, or for companies to survive, and, and it's a good question, Tony, to, to ask, you know, how will we continue to import within the, EU, within the EU? Companies themselves will actually have to have a greater rigor. Um, and from a legal perspective, in, to ensure their continuity from an economic perspective, um, will have to probably address their own internal policies and processes as well. So notwithstanding that the legislation does not correlate currently in terms of penalties and that sort of thing uh, with where seemingly the EU legislation is going. Um, I think in order for them to survive uh, sort of, you know, as entities within the financial model, they will need to redress um, and, and look at what their compliance, um, I suppose, aspirations and obligations will be. I don't know if that answers Tony's question. I bought it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just wary, wary of time as well. I've got five minutes left, so maybe time for, for one more. Um, so from uh, Paola, pa pa Paola, I think it's Paola. I'm terrible with names, aren't I? Um, but she's, um, why is it so normalized being proud of having a, a shopping addiction? Is there anything going on about addressing this behavior as unhealthy? And Paula tells a story about how um, one of her friends has wardrobes entirely full of unpacked or unused clothing. I know my fiance still has uh, two year old dresses with tags on never used. So it, it's, is there something about the, the conscious or the psyche of sort of the, what it's like to live in modern times in modernity where um, we have an unhealthy relationship with retail therapy and, and, and shopping in, in general. It's a good question. And I can only ask from my perspective, what is missing within ourselves? Mm -hmm. So we just need to have this insatiable desire for more and more. I think the paradigm will be actually shifted with us as individuals being responsible and being active in our choices because our voice is important but our actions have fundamental consequences for the rest of the planet and climate change is real social problems are real so time is up mm -hmm. change starts from within and let's ask ourselves how we can become part of the solution rather than the problem itself so this is uh, a very this important question, but uh, I think psychological and also uh, behavioral uh, patterns that should emerge start uh, from all reflections. So, yeah, but enough consumption, so enough is enough. Thank you, Hakan. Um, yeah, I think if, if I can just, if I think I can comment on that, it's all about um, sort of per, perception of self-value. I think with the rise of social media and other ways within which we engage in a public space, especially for young people as well, we're often made to feel not good enough. Um, and I think that, that, that reinforces this narrative of, oh, well, if you don't feel good enough, maybe if you look better, you'll feel better. And then there's always that kind of the glass is always shattered at the end and we're always let down. And maybe it wasn't 
this outfit. Maybe I need to go and buy something else. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. Um, Emma, should we? Uh, Emma, are you happy to come uh, off mute to just ask your last question of today? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would just. There seems to be this constant sort of narrative of kind of is it consumers, is it brands, is it policymakers that are going to change this, and um, and uh, it's all been fascinating. I think. I mean, on a positive note, I've sort of been hanging around in the sort of sustainable forum and it feels to me like there's been a massive, massive, massive sort of snowballing and things are really, you know, really starting to feel more positive and more like change is coming. Um, but it will take, I think, um, everybody to work together. I think there's a new hashtag, think like a citizen rather than a consumer. And that kind of is the nugget for me. Um, so I suppose it was more of a comment than a question, wasn't it really? That's fine, we love a good comment. Um, one minute left, I'll just open it up very broadly if there's any final comments um, before we close up this wonderful round table from today. I think I would just note to anyone who's um, uh, you're wondering about the way kind of brands communicate them and, and with what they can do i would just say just be wary of um of brands who are saying that um the solution lies within buying something made a slightly better version of something made within the same system and at the same volume just caught a note of caution around that um just quickly coming in um being a campaigner, I think one of the things that uh, that I would say is rather than the individual consumer um, acting on her own or his own, very important that that action is quite important, but really join some of the major campaigns that's taking place, um, highlighting the, the issue, but also offering solutions, putting pressure on brands, putting pressure on um, governments, um, is one of the ways to change some of these things. So I think it's about join those campaigns. Um, I can name quite a few clean clothes campaign, uh, labor behind, uh, label behind the labor. And I think all of those are gonna be, they can be forced for good, but consumers need to be very much part of that. We need a large number, a real collective to put that pressure on on um, those that are making the decisions, whether it's the economic model or whether it's government's policy or as a con consumer. So join the join campaigns. Thank you, Barty. And apologies, my building fire alarm's just gone off, but I think it's a drill, so don't worry. Um, I think that's time, unfortunately. It's, um, it's flown by. Please do look up um, Hakan's, uh, Hakan and Vera's um, academic work on Google Scholar, and Hakan's also been published in, in many, many fashion magazines. Um, similarly, please do look up um, Sophie's writings in The Guardian, Days, Refinery29, and other places. And also, please do check out Justice and Fashion, um, run by Sharon and uh, with Barty as an ambassador. Um, who are doing some wonderful work um, in, in the justice and fashion uh, space. Um, we've released loads of interviews today on our social media, so please do check them out. And we've actually done two sessions with Vera because they were that interesting. Um, and uh, what else? We'll be back same time tomorrow to, to look at, uh, we're looking at tomorrow, new forms of circular economy. Um, so I hope to see some of you, if not all of you there. Thank you so much. Thank you to our speakers. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you all soon. Round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thank you.